I worked for a judge my first summer who was a really nice guy. And at the end of the summer, he sat me down. He's like, you know, I don't think practicing law is for you. Interesting. And I was horrified. And wow. I mean, that's that's like, that's that's the dude telling you, you probably shouldn't be doing this for a living. And it's probably the best advice I ever got. Thank you for joining us on the Evolve Your Brand Podcast. I'm your host, Olia Merkies, and I am so freaking excited for this guest. He has uh, gone through a journey to get here, like seriously a journey. So Fred Ben from Zoom Casa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's really pleasure yeah. to be here. So can you share the, the journey that you've gone through? Take a second and tell our audience what it took to finally sit in that seat. I think it was at least one rescheduling. I recently had a kid, so... Um... We're roughly eight weeks in. Uh, I think last time I had a kid two it was two days before, day before we were scheduled to be on. I was actually planning to come, but my wife um, had other instructions. So I'm glad we can make it work today. And your ring is still on. So smart on. man. Thank smart. You. Yeah, like you're already winning. Yeah, learning to listen. <laughs> <laughs> you're already winning. Um, where, how did the Fred story begin? Like where did it begin? <clears throat> I'm born and raised in LA. Uh, first generation, uh, you know, literally never left the town. I uh, went to college and grad school in LA and got into commercial real estate and eventually migrated to residential real estate and decided to start a company called Zoom Casa. And that's been the last six ish years. Uh, and what was important to me was kind of our approach to the residential real estate was a little bit different than really any other company we were aware of. And we really spent the last, you know, five, six years refining that and learning how to uh, add value to the ecosystem. And that was kind of what was unique about our approach was how do we support and promote other folks in the ecosystem to do their job better and deliver more value to clients? Yeah, we're definitely going to jump into that because I think once uh, the audience hears what, what you've built at Zoom Casa on really helping people. I'm, I'm excited to share that with them. Uh, what, what part of LA did you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? Like what, what do you? Uh... Sure. I uh, grew up in the Valley. So I'm first generation. My, my mother's family came here after the war. They were, my grandparents were both Holocaust survivors. Really? My, uh, my mom was actually born in Poland and uh, I grew up in, and now the Valley is predominant, those parts of the Valley are predominantly, you know, Latino, but Back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was mostly a Jewish neighborhood where Jews would come to the U.S. and immigrate from Eastern Europe. So uh, grew up in the Valley, went to high school in the Valley, went to college at UCLA, went to grad school at SC, uh, and never left. Um, what uh, what did you enjoy about <clears throat> the Valley when you were growing up? What's your fondest memory? If you're not familiar with the valley, it's hard to conceptualize. You have these massive, massive streets that are just, it's a perfect grid system. It's almost like Manhattan, but without the density. And this was a great place to grow up. It's, it's totally different today. You'd have a real sense of community. You'd have you know, ease to get anywhere. And it was safe and quiet. It was great. Would you mind, let's go down this path. You know, you, you talked about safe and community. Um, you're in real estate now. You're dealing with residential. What, what's different in, from in what the valley specifically or yeah. just in general? Well, let's talk uh, about the valley since we're in the valley. Everything is unaffordable, you know, mm. and it's really been a failure of urban planning to densify these areas in a way that's intelligent. So as a result of that, and, you know, it's kind of a polemic, but between all urban policies, whether it's rent control or uh, lack of upzoning, you have essentially urban decay and you have massively unaffordable housing with really shitty retail and really shitty public transportation. And there's not a good way to fix it. So it's, it's really unfortunate to kind of see in a place where you grew up and you understood the potential degrade. And not just degrade from a from a functional or, or living standard perspective, but also from quality of life for the people that live there. 
So, you know, if you're a young professional in LA, you're essentially priced out of home ownership unless you're really in the boonies. And the places that would be great to raise a family, and even if you can afford to get your foot in the door there, it's not walkable. It's not really even drivable. I mean, it's a it's a tough place now. And I I I I am hopeful that uh that gets turned around. And I think there's some hope that with Caruso being elected, but that obviously didn't work out so well. So it's it's really a failure of public policy. It's really sad. It's really sad. And I don't know how you fix it. I, I think... But know, we're trying to fix it with ADUs. We can talk about that. We will, definitely will talk about ADUs because, yeah. you know, I think, uh, you know, as a real estate professional... I, I scratch my head sometimes thinking to myself, like, are, are, is our government designed to help people or hurt people? Why are we not paying more attention to the amount of inventory that we're creating every single year? Do, do you know what, do you want to know a scary stat? Sure. I think the goal for the last 10 years per year, as far as unions bill for, uh, for the state of California is 250,000. Last year was a record breaking year. They were proud of it. It was like 110,000 homes they built. How many of those were affordable? Oh, I mean, <laughs> builders are not building homes for affordability. Builders are building homes sure. for, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's fascinating to me that you, you, you brought up like hopeless several times. And yeah. I think that's what defeats communities is when you have that hopelessness. 100%. There's no question about it. Yeah. So I do want to, you know, I, I do want to dig into like, how, how do we solve that? And then you brought up ADU. So that'll be, that'll be a great conversation. Before we get there, you went to UCLA and then USC. I did. They allow that? You know? <laughs> they actually I'm just curious. They actually Let's go. It. They actually encourage it. They encourage yeah. it. Okay. I'm not, I'm not a big football guy. So I thought, I wasn't talking about football. I, I just thought that well, schools the, didn't like each the other. Big, that's the big rivalry. It is. So, but, <laughs> Uh, I had a great experience at both. Uh, nothing, nothing negative. It was great. Yeah. What was, a, and I, you know, come across as a negative guy, which I appreciate because there's plenty of that. So it's easier to be positive. What, what was, uh, what was the biggest difference between the two schools? Well, one's a private institution, obviously, and one's public. And it's a totally different experience as a customer, which is what you are as a student, <laughs> understanding, you know, the difference in output. And, you know, it's kind of like the difference between going to a Walmart, which is a fantastic institution versus going to, you know, an ultra high-end retail store. Right. And it was a totally different experience, you know, whether services available, fixing problems, any, anything you needed, it was right at your fingertips. And it was kind of fascinating to watch how a public institution, which by the way, is fantastic as well regarded and really well run. But just because of its size and structure, can't be as nimble. It's kind of fascinating to watch that. Experience Ooh, it. that's fire! So USC is more nimble. There's no question. It's it's private. They can yeah. do what they want, right? So, you know, I did a, a joint program, and you need a, an exception on this or something else. You pick up the phone, done. Was that your inspiration for Zoom costing? You're like, dude, I'm just going to get rid of the financing struggle. <laughs> Some of it, but I mean, it's. it's why I got into commercial real estate was, you know, professors and folks in that space, you know, introducing me to it. I had no family or personal experience with it. Got it. So your, your profession really stem when you went to USC? So I went there for grad school. I went there for law school and then eventually went there for also business school. I did okay. A program. And you know, I never even thought about going into commercial real estate. I thought I was going to become a federal prosecutor. Oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, I worked for a judge my first summer who's a really nice guy. And at the end of the summer, he sat me down. He's like, you know, I don't think practicing law is for you. Interesting. And I was horrified. And I was like, wow. I mean, that's that's like, that's that's the dude telling you, you probably shouldn't be doing this for a living. And it's probably the best advice I ever got. And uh, I decided that I was, well, I'm already in the middle of the program. You might as well finish it. And in law school, your first year is, your, is the hardest. So I was like, well, if I'm already here, why don't I go to business school? And I did that. And uh, a bunch of different professors, and it was kind of just coincidental, introduced me to commercial real estate, apartment business, and got me off to the start. And that's, that's how I got into that space. How did, how did you, pro do you remember the judge's name? Sure, Neil Basin. Ne what, Neil Basin, what, 
how did you process that? Like, you've been working towards this. What was that? What was that like? I think you first a little bit surprised, but it was, uh, you take feedback. You have to learn to take feedback and, and appreciate it and understand it. Yeah. yeah. What did he tell you? I mean, I guess that's what I'm, he's like, <laughs> I don't think this is for you. Like, what did he point out? Like, I was, you seem like a really bright guy. I don't understand. I'm like, what was he looking at? So I worked for, he was a bankruptcy judge. And at the time he had just gotten on the bench and I had a project to uh, do a research memo on section 365 of the bankruptcy code, which is about executory contracts. And an executory contract is a fancy word for a contract that requires you to perform something. Okay. And most typically that's a lease. So for instance, when like a Staples or someone goes bankrupt, those leases typically don't just end. They can be purchased by other retailers and they'll then take those spaces over. And the reason that those leases have value is that typically the rent is below market. Okay. So just by virtue of that cost savings, there's value in that lease. Now, landlords don't like that because, you know, well, if the lease is below market, I want to terminate it and get a new tenant. So this is a very uh, core part of the bankruptcy code. And it's something that's litigated and went over and is very, very complicated. And I did a really shitty job. I, was, I did a terrible job. I was bored out of my mind. Oh, okay. And I did the work. You know, I still I still chugged away at it over the summer, but it was it was pretty shitty. And it was obvious that that was not something I was going to be passionate about and not something that I would enjoy. Um, but a lot of times when, you know, when you're studious and your your parents push you to do things, especially as an immigrant, like, and you got to be a lawyer. And it was very clear to me that that was not the right path. So I owe him a huge debt of gratitude. I, I was going to say, like, what a, what a gift he gave you. Follow yeah. your passions, man. That's that's amazing. So what what was different when you got into the commercial space? I, I Growing up as an immigrant, you never really had perception of running your own business and being able to pull levers and see immediate changes in results. And I enter the commercial real estate space right, right as the economy was recovering in the early 2010s. And, and it know, was like a 25 year old. I remember, you know, literally didn't know shit from shit. And I was like, that person's going to loan me 5 million bucks to go buy this building that is drug infested and full of, you know, gang members. I can do that. It was kind of blew my mind. And uh, I ended up, doing a lot of demographic research and I decided I wanted to build a business in Sacramento. So I started buying uh, bank owned distressed apartment buildings and built a business out of buying these buildings, renovating them, rehabbing them uh, and running them under, under a brand. And this was a, this was essentially like what they called workforce housing at the time. They didn't really, hadn't really codified that term, but these are market rate apartments that are, quasi affordable at the time, you know, one bedroom is like 12, 1300 bucks a month versus luxury product at, you know, 2000 plus. Yeah. So your typical tenant base or, you know, working families that I don't want to say they live paycheck to paycheck, but these are not folks that are probably going to own a home and they're looking for a, a, a quiet, safe place to call home and live there. You solved the need. Can you solve that need now? We need a lot more of that. Oof. I don't know. It's tough. <laughs> that it's was really tough. Yeah, that was. I think that was me taking a shot across the bow. I think the ADU thing might. That's a whole tougher. Subject. Yeah, you know what? We definitely we'll dig into that because ADUs I think are one of the most brilliant strategies to not only solve our affordability issues yeah. but also create more housing. Like that. That we're, we're going to get into it because this this is incredible in regards to just understanding the journey of. Mm -hmm. You know, because you, you've been involved with building and thinking outside the box. Like you were way ahead of your time at that point as as building that because, you know, a lot of a lot of what I've learned about business and finance has been like, if you recognize that opportunity has presented itself, it's already too late because mm -hmm. people has already. So it's really forward thinking on what the next opportunity. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. So. You you get into that, you do the project, build out the business in, in Sacramento. How long were you in Sacramento? Like, were you living there or were you like- No, I moved there. You did? Yeah. For how long How long were you in, in, in Sacramento? And then how, did About you sell that years. business? So I, I decided that, we'll take a step back. So most, Sacramento is interesting because it's the largest metropolitan area in the country that's in a floodplain. 
And most of the housing stock, almost all of the housing stock, rental housing stock, uh, was built in the 60s, wood frame, two-story construction. It was okay. not built in a floodplain. And in the early 2000s, as the housing market boomed, the federal government was petitioned to reclassify part of the Sacramento area that was formerly in a floodplain out of a floodplain, which is meaningful because it allowed home it allowed home builders to buy really cheap farmland and build houses there and sell them with federally insured mortgages. So renters in 08, 09 had this choice where I live in a slum 60s built apartment that's not been maintained or I can move out and now rent a two-year-old townhouse that was foreclosed on. So you saw this massive trade out from renters in the Sacramento region and the apartment business that got decimated it took about five, six years for it to go back into equi equilibrium. I mean like 50, 60% occupancy. That's, wow. that's all you could do and rents down 30 plus percent. So for me, I said, this is an opportunity generationally to buy these assets, uh, uh, distressed assets, turn them around and build a long-term business. So I did just that, built a brand around it. It was probably the first brand in workforce housing. I didn't realize when you have a brand in the apartment business, there's basically zero benefit to it because no tenant leaves you a positive review. So you gain nothing. Uh, and no one looks up the brand of the apartment building they're moving to. They're not like, wow, this is this is the, the Louis Vuitton of apartments. No, this is zero value. So I learned this the hard way, but... I was building this for the long term and right. uh, I got shot at over a PlayStation and I said, you know, life is too short and the market at the time had appreciated pretty significantly. I said, I'm out. So I started selling them off and this was pre-COVID. I sold my last one in August of 19. Oh, really? So talk wow. about like good timing and uh, got out of that business entirely. Is there anything you miss about it or no? You know, if you asked me in September of 19, I would have said yes. After COVID, no. Okay. I think kind of my conclusion was that in as a rental housing provider at scale, you are essentially a public utility. Yeah. How the government can essentially give your tenants the ability not to pay rent, it, it, it's an entirely different calculus. It wasn't part, it wasn't part of the risk spectrum when you did that analysis, you know, in 2019, 2020 afterwards, now it's part of the equation. Oh, it has to be. I mean, it just, you know, what I don't understand is, you know, during that period of time, you don't know how many, uh, like private investors I had, mm -hmm. Fred, that were like hosed and I'm trying to figure out creative financing solutions. It's like, yeah. how do we not protect, like California has the highest percentage of small business owners like, how do you not protect those? And then we shell out all guys. I mean, like you said, it, it just, you're, you're trying to compute and it just doesn't compute. It doesn't make any sense. So good for you for timing, you know? <laughs> I'm not a religious person, but at that time, <laughs> March of 20, I was like, wow, that worked out really well. Okay. Um, what was the biggest lesson that you learned during, you know, uh, what, what was the name of the business? Uh, well, parent company is called Seren Capital, Seren. which is now my family office. And okay. uh, the brand was called Sur Apartments. Sur? Sur. Okay. Which uh, in Spanish means south and in French means safe or something along those lines. Perfect. Terrible idea. Don't Never create an apartment brand. Just don't do it. That's okay. You're yeah. great at what you do. We and, and you work with a production studio that creates your brand for you. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Nice plug. Um what was the biggest lesson that you learned as an entrepreneur that still sticks with you today? I think taking feedback mm. rapidly. Let's go. Let's dig into like that. Learning from the client, learning from people that work for you, just internalizing it, changing, trying it again. You need to have a tight feedback loop. Interesting. So you learn how to listen? You have to know how to listen, but actually take the feedback and not be defensive about it and, mm. implement, and implement uh, systems and processes to, to address that feedback. Yeah. Who, who is the biggest person that, that made that shift for you where you're like, man, I really got to listen. That was, that was a golden nugget. Do you remember that moment where you're like, man, it makes all the difference to listen to your people? 
you just hear it 50 times from 50 people. <laughs> and you're like, this is something you should pay attention to. Has it made your life easier? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Okay. Who, who's like the influencers that you follow? Like people that have, you're like, man, I, I like this thought leader. Who are people that you consume I'm there? A, I'm a big reader. I really like biographies. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a whole spectrum, but on the, on the real estate side, you know, business anyway. side, like, you know, Sam Zell, I'm in the middle of the Elon Musk biography right now. Um, a lot of folks, I think you can learn from other people's mistakes. And I try to do that. Yeah. I was just curious who stands out to you because that, that helps me understand. Like there's people that I follow. I also like to, to I, I like to read about how other people had difficulty so I can try to avoid that. I know. So one, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do in that regard is read, you know, SEC filings. So, SEC filings. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, whether you talk about companies like Open Door, Better Mortgage or OfferPad, uh, Countrywide, et cetera, it's kind of fascinating to, to watch how businesses evolve over time. That's a SEC filings. Yeah, okay. you read an annual report of Countrywide. It's fascinating year over year, and you see how the business just changed from, you know, a leading national mortgage provider that was doing a paper to growth focused and basically getting that expanding their their lending box into stuff. It's fascinating, totally right. fascinating. Yeah, and and what's something? I mean, when it comes to the finance mm -hmm. world, as you were getting ready for Zoom Casa, and I'm excited to hear that that story, how th this came to be. What is it about like residential financing, commercial financing? Like what are your what are your thoughts about how to make it better? Like what gaps do you see in, in residential financing that you think can be improved? Well, big question. Um, I think there needs to be a, a bigger, more vibrant, you know, non-QM market, mm -hmm. which doesn't, abuse borrowers on rate. So I think like a DSCR product is brilliant, but you know, and I think it's just a question of time, right? Once the product gets more mainstream spreads compress and it gets more affordable, but you know, the markets needed a DSCR product for single family for 50 years. Like why did it, why did it come about three years ago? But you know, more power to folks that are doing that. Uh, I think that there needs to be a better product for self-employed people. Like, it's mind boggling. Crazy. It's crazy. If you have a W2, you're a better borrower than someone that has millions of dollars in the bank and makes a million dollars. Like what? It's just crazy to me. I call that, that banking, no common sense. The financial, Fred, I'm appalled at like, now that I'm in the finance world, holy shit. Yeah. What the, f I'm sorry, what the fuck? And when you go on the back end, you try to create that product. It's not for a lack of capital. It's the regulations that make it so challenging right. to do. Right. Well, and 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 who creates regulations is politicians. And I'm like, dude, you're you're. This this is the one part that doesn't make sense to me. And please comment on it. You are a public servant. You are here to serve the public. If you listen to the public, the public is telling you there isn't enough housing. Affordability is a massive issue. We have a lot of people that want to buy that we're forcing to leave the state because there is no affordability. And it's not just the middle class and the lower class. Now you're starting to see wealth leave the state at a scary rate. Of course. And that's why when you spend so much time talking about finance, I wanted to pick your brain because like you're digging into it. Most people in real estate don't dig into the finance side, which I don't get. Cause that so impacts that's interesting. Yeah. 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 So let's, uh, let's jump in. Zoom Casa, the vision, how it came to be, who, who helped you build it? Yeah. So we started in 2017 ish kind of serendipitously. I decided I want to kind of get out of the apartment business and I had my own construction company and this is in Sacramento. So I said I would go flip houses okay. and, uh, I made offers on 27 short sales this is back when they were still short sales. And each and every time I was outbid by a Facebook or Google engineer from San Francisco or Bay Area doing home flipping on the weekend after they went to, uh, who's that guy that did seminars or Mondo month to something, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I, know. I don't think he's still around. I don't know. Maybe he is. And every single time I was outbid, I'm like, my costs, I know to a penny. I was buying stuff in bulk from China. I had containers. I'm like, there's no way 
some dude that works at, at Facebook can make money doing this. And I realized very quickly they weren't. <laughs> and I got really pissed off because I spent the time actually underwriting these properties and writing offers. And it's like, you know, what the fuck? I wrote 27 offers, not one. And in Sacramento at the time, there was a, a part of the community called North Highlands, which was predominantly a place where African-American, it was predominantly African-American community where folks had bought homes for literally fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in the 80s. And those homes, and this is back in 17, were, if they were turnkey, 400000 If they were sold to an investor, it was around 200000 So the basic okay. math was you pay 200 210 you put in 100 150 and you sell for 400 And each of those homes, they were not properly maintained because these folks had bought them typically with FHA loans, but they didn't have the income or wherewithal to invest in them for the last 40 years. So investors would come and buy them, flip them, and you know make fifty hundred thousand dollars like that. And who's getting screwed? It's the homeowners. Mm. So, and I'll be totally frank with you: is I was I was pissed off because I couldn't buy the house as an investor. Yeah. So I said, well, what if I? And I had this kind of an epiphany one week, and I said, what if I went to the the seller and I said, well, I'll help you flip your own house. And what's the what's the difficulty? Well, one, you got to figure out what to do. And you got to figure out how to do it. And you got to pay for it. So I said, what if I create a product where as a seller, you come to us and we will flip your house for you and you pay me when your home sells. And I'll have a profit margin in the work that we do. And then I don't have to actually own the asset and you as the seller will keep most of the profit. And it seemed like a no brainer. And then it was question, well, how do you get to homeowners? Yeah. So I started cold calling real estate agents and taking them out to coffee and lunch and all that fun stuff. And the typical feedback was, you know, I sell five homes a year. I'm in the gym every day by 10 a.m. This sounds really cool, but I'm good, bro. And no one gave a shit. And it blew my mind because I was talking about, as a real estate agent, how do you differentiate yourself to win more listings? Well, what if you go to these neighborhoods and tell homeowners, you know, we'll help you sell your home for significantly more money, uh, but zero. And Around that time, unbeknownst to me, Compass, the brokerage had rolled out what was called Compass Concierge. Okay. So we started getting phone calls from other brokerages. Are you a concierge service? And I had a, a dinky little website up. I don't think we had a phone number and on the website. And after like five calls, we're like, what, what is a concierge service? And we met some agents from Sotheby's and from Berkshire Hathaway. And they're like, yeah, Compass has this program. They front the cost renovations. We need to compete with this. So as with most sales, it's easier to sell to fear and they had to compete. So we went to some largest brokerages and said, listen, like this is a competitive landscape. You need a solution to compete. We will build you a private labeled solution for this in-house, totally turnkey. And overnight we rolled out with Sotheby's, Berkshire Hathaway, Keller Williams, and a lot of other large brokerages. And between 20... 18 in March of 20, you know, we went from starting in SoCal to being in like 30 States and doing a few million dollars a month of renovations. So it, it grew really rapidly. And then we took it through COVID, which was really challenging because we actually had contractors and folks in, in people's homes, which it's an odd conversation where it's like, yeah, you're in the middle of a $200,000 renovation, but we're going to stop now and we may not ever sell our house. Well, you need to pay us. Oh, I'm sorry, it's COVID. Click. So it was it was a tough time. Um, and again, listen to your clients' feedback. A lot of homeowners that we work with said, "Listen, like I love that you're renovating my house, but I want to unlock some of my equity so I can buy another house first and not have to live through this mess." And we said, "Okay, well, we'll create a bridge loan product." And after learning about consumer regulations and Reg Z and ATR analysis and all this other fun stuff, we actually created a compliant bridge loan product and rolled it out. And the lesson was that most of these clients that were trying to buy before they sold, part of the issue was they needed a down payment, but the bigger issue is they needed to fix their, their debt to income ratio to qualify for the new loan. So just by doing the cash out bridge loan, it didn't solve that problem 
Yeah. And they had the money, but they couldn't qualify. So again, you know, on the weekend thinking, how do we fix this problem? Well, what if instead of doing it as a bridge loan, we actually buy their house? So that was the genesis of what we call our forward program. And today, I think that that's the only solution in the marketplace that does a few things. Number one, it allows you as a seller to sell your home 10 to 15 days for cash. Number two, it allows you to become a non-contingent buyer. Number three, you still get to work with your preferred agent and lender. And number four, and this is what makes it unique, is it helps you maximize your equity. Mm. So there's a lot of solutions in the marketplace you can do one, two, or three. But there's no solution where you can do all one, two, three, and maximize your equity. So the way the Ford program works is we get an appraisal of your house and an inspection. We buy your home, and it's a structured transaction. Structured just means there's two checks instead of one. And we give you enough money up front to pay off your mortgage and cash out some of your equity. And now you don't have a mortgage anymore, so it's a lot easier to qualify for the new loan. You got some cash in your pocket. And then we'll go through, if the home needs renovations, renovate it for you. You tell you, you have to pr prove everything, but we'll do it for you. And then we list it with your preferred agent. And when the home sells, we get paid back what we gave you up front plus the improvements. We pay closing costs. We take 5 to 10%, and the seller gets the difference. So back in napkin math is as a consumer selling your house, you're keeping roughly 90 to 95% of the after repair value of your home, which is usually more than 100% of the as-is value. And you don't have to deal with showings, living through renovations, being a contingent buyer, et cetera. So that's, the, that's where we've evolved today. You did the hormosi. You solved every problem. Well, we're I mean, as much on. as you can. So we're working on it. <laughs> but we're trying. I gave you too much credit, but but you get where I was yeah, going. We're trying, like, we're trying to do that. And, and how come that meant something to you? Like, why why did you want the homeowners uh, to benefit from the equity? Because I'll, I'll touch on it, but I'm curious. Because I think that there's so many products in the marketplace that are extractive, where for a company to make a, a profit, it requires taking something from someone else. No. <sighs> And it's a kind of an interesting perspective to build a business where you're trying to make the pie bigger and in turn, you know, you get a piece and everyone gets a bigger piece and everyone's happy. And you look at everyone trying to disrupt the residential real estate space, it requires removing the agent from the transaction, it requires moving the mortgage broker from the transaction. Well, they're adding the most value. Why are you trying to take them out of the equation instead of empowering them to really solve their clients' problems and add more value? Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to touch on that because I'm in this space you're partnering with people that actually think that way because most, you said most agents you reached out to, they rejected the the initial idea. And to me, I would have been like, okay, tell me more. I'm curious. I can help people. And do you know what I'm, what I've gotten great at? Like, I don't do loans. I don't do loans. Like if you want a loan, don't call me. I solve financial problems for people. Mm -hmm. I get to know you. I understand what what you're trying to accomplish, what you want to solve. And that's the power of being a real estate professional. That's the type of impact you can make. And that's why I'm so passionate about what Zoom Cost is doing. Mm -hmm. It's like you actually are allowing homeowners to share in the equity gain that's being forced. And you're solving all the most of the problems that get in the way of doing that. Yep. And from your perspective as a real estate professional, what's unique about our company is we are intentionally not a direct consumer business. So we don't talk to homeowners. A homeowner calls, we don't know how to work with them. So our services are exclusively offered. Get out. No, nope, that's the business. Really? We spent $4,300 on marketing last year. So you, you, don't, you don't do any direct consumer? Zero. Okay. Well, we got to talk about your marketing number. But that, that's it's great. It's a, <laughs> a great number. <laughs> I, I love the organic. I'm, a, I'm all about the organic, but I also think, you know, this is the way I look at brand and marketing. Uh, most of my business comes from referrals. What I've learned is this is the best comment I ever learned. Let's transition to branding for a second. It's, uh, I was listening to a brand ambassador and he said, you know, it doesn't really matter how great you are at what you do and the difference that you make for people if nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, e. Ouch. Because I, I don't, I, I've, I've really focused on posting every day. So you have organic growth. How are you getting your message out to get more agents, more mortgage advice? 
I'm a mortgage advisor. I'm not a loan officer. There are loan officers out there, sure. but I really advise people on those solutions. So what's your strategy now with regards to getting that message out on Zoom Casa? It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm, so we okay. have account executives and it's one relationship at a time. Yeah. And it's slow and it's, a, it's, it's not easy, but that's how you differentiate yourself. And that's how you build a sustainable, durable franchise. Yeah, and yeah, what's the biggest progress you've made over the last 12 months that you're, you're proud of with regards to the Zoom Casa? I think last year was a, a year we really grew and it's a challenge in, in, a, in the real estate market to get agents, brokers, lenders. When, when times are good, I'm too busy focusing on what I'm doing to really think and be strategic. And last year, a lot of our partners were a little bit slower naturally with rates where they were. And they were willing to kind of take a minute to think strategically instead of just focusing on the deal at hand. And we've seen folks that really have taken their business to the next level by mm. doing so with us. Is there is there someone that stands out to you that you, you have a personal relationship with, connection, a success story? Like you might as well give them a shout out too if they're... Uh, yeah. So there's various Keller Williams agents, you know, a guy named Keith Koss. Okay. Uh, has a license for literally 20 years. Right. And... For him, it was a side hustle. And now he's doing, you know, I don't know, 10 to $15 million a year in production. And he charges a 7% commission. He keeps five, he gives out two to the buyer's agent. And the way he justifies that is he's solving his client's problems. Yeah. And he does that by using Zoom Casa. So for instance, all of his clients, they need to become a non-contingent buyer. They want to sell quickly. They have some sort of financial distress, whatever it might be. He's in the business of solving problems. And... He's marketed himself as a concierge service and as a concierge mm -hmm. agent. And personally, I think the word concierge is overused and I think it's misused, but that's what the market wants. And he's been tremendously successful with that. So you talk about, you know, how do you, how do you have a case study of someone that is intelligent and entrepreneurial and has actually used products like Zoom Casa to differentiate themselves, add value, solve problems and get paid to do it. And he's, he's, a, he's a shining example. We have, we have hundreds of folks like him. So when I tell you it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's literally one relationship at a time and retraining agents how to be an agent. You know, for instance, we teach agents how to prospect. So we ask agents, like, how do you prospect? You, most of the time, it's, well, you know, I call expireds. I call FISBOs. Well, what do you say? And normally it's it's the same script they learn from some coach. And it's about how I'm a good agent and I'm in a market and I do and I have social media followers, whatever it might be. And we'll ask them, don't you think it would be better if you called and expired and said, Hey, I see your home was listed for a million bucks. I have a cash offer for your home for a million dollars that can close in 10 to 15 days. May I come to your home this afternoon and show it to you? And sometimes all the time. Sometimes the light goes off. Now they'll take that offer. It's a structured offer. It may not be the right fit for the seller. Yeah. But worst case scenario, okay, let's list your home for sale. One of my reps brought in an agent in LA. She's a newer agent and she's literally was door knocking, calling expireds. She made 14 calls to expireds, got using this technique of 14 calls, got two listing appointments. Both sellers said that they are not interested in the structured offer. One of the two sellers said, I'd like to list my home traditionally with you. She got a $1.4 million listing. So, you know, the proof's in the pudding. As a real estate agent, yeah. you need to differentiate yourself and add value. And that's that's how you justify your existence. Yeah, and and that's where, like, I've when I came in to the industry, and I only started in 2019, you know, I was out of passion for real estate, but just didn't know where to start. So I would say I was a brand new novice, like you on the home, but you didn't know how to leverage the equity or anything because nobody taught me. Like, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then I'm like, how can I, how can I stand out by doing what everybody else does? Like, I don't, I can't blend in. How do you blend in? Like what, if, if somebody has been at it, you, you said Keith, I think was for 20 years, right? Sure. How do I start today and compete with Keith that's been in it for 20 years? I got to do something different. And I'm like, I don't want to be a commodity. I, I want to break in the concierge. I never talk about that. I look at myself as a guide. 
You know, I'm here to guide you through the hardest, I think one of the hardest real estate markets in California because it's so competitive and people don't go into them with eyes wide open. Sure. They think that they have all the leverage and they really don't. You know, buyers and sellers right now with where we're at, it's crazy. So I love how you're saying it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's how do you stand out? Because it's not enough just for you to know like your market comps, which... I would say some do, some don't. So there, there's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. It's freaking awesome how like you're you're in the thick of it. Like you're not a disengaged CEO. You like you're in the thick of it. Oh yeah, I'm. I physically oversee the sales team. So most sales calls, I'll even jump on you. Really? Mm -hmm. You said everybody in your company uh, has to start in sales. That's correct. How come? We have a a culture that focuses on elating clients, whether those clients are homeowners or real estate agents or lenders or other partners we have. And it's really important that everyone that works in this organization understands literally from the ground level what it's like to close a deal, work with a client and meet their expectations. So, you know, if you're working operations, I don't want a transaction coordinator that doesn't understand that their job is to close the deal. You know, your job is not to push paper. Your job is to close the deal. Do you like sales yourself? Uh, growing up, I hated it. I actually love it now. Ooh, yeah. okay. I, again, I, I, technically, it's a sales job, right? But I don't look at it as sales. It's uh, it's not. Yeah, no. it, we're in the business of solving people's problems. Okay, so I was going to ask you. You already jumped ahead. Wow, how do you jump ahead on the host, man? Like Sorry. you can't answer the question. No, I'm kidding, uh, Fred. I'm thoroughly enjoying this. This is this is freaking awesome. You said you went from not liking sales to liking it. What changed for you that you actually had that transition happen? I had never been in a traditional sales role before. I just had this perception of sales as something that was, you know, like a used car salesman. Mm. And I think most people like grow up, it's, unless you have a family member that works in sales, there's a perception that it's bad and unseemly. Uh, and I found in, in, I found in life, it's the exact opposite. Now, you know, our job when we sell our product is to educate, which I personally enjoy. And I think it's really great that we get to get on calls with homeowners around the country and, What's your problem? How can we solve it? And if it's not the right fit, great, we'll tell you, but at least here's a solution for you. Do you have a homeowner story you could share that stands out to you? Like where you just made a difference and then actually gave you the energy and enthusiasm inside. You're like, fuck, I'm making a difference. Yeah, we had one, uh, I think it closed in December and it was a couple in the Bay Area. They had a house. They lived there for like 46 years. They owned the house, lived there, raised their kids there, grandkids live there. It was time to move to a nursing home and oh. they needed to unlock their equity to make that move. And the house needed a bunch of work and the yeah, house appraised for like 2 million bucks, which seemed a little bit low, but it was, it was all original. And they used our program to unlock about a million bucks up front and they moved to assisted living facility. And then we went in and helped the whole family package everything and do garage sale we spent about a quarter million dollars renovating the home and ended up selling for 3.925, which was massively more than anyone's expectations. And I actually got a call from the homeowner uh, calling me to complain about taxes. <laughs> and he's like, and I was like, and I actually didn't know the deal myself because I didn't close. I wasn't involved. So I was like, let me, and he was just complaining that taxes were too. I'm like, and he's an older guy. So I, I look into the deal and I look at the math and I call him back and I'm like, you know, sir, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Just in pure profit dollars, you made about a million and a half dollars more than you would have selling your home as is. And you're upset because you only get to keep roughly a million dollars of that. Well, it's absurd, you know, and he has some choice words to talk about Biden and some other stuff. I'm like, but this is good for you, right? Like a million dollars after tax is better than zero dollars after tax, right? It's like, yeah, I suppose you could say that. So, and a lot of folks in client facing, in, in customer facing industries, like it's really hard to elate the client, but I got a real big kick out of that. And I talked to his wife afterwards and she had a lot more, she had a lot more positive experience. Than right, right. <laughs> but it's, uh, the agent looked like a rock star and the agents got like four or five referrals from the, the facility where the gentleman went, because they have a lot of clients that, you know, I, I tripped, I fell, I need to move quickly. Well, oh, okay, I'm going to sell my home to an investor. I'm going to get my face ripped off. This is a radically better option. So stories like that make me really happy. And I, it kind of made, it gave me a laugh that, 
you know, you complain about paying tax when you're making a few million bucks. Um, Fred, I want you to know, I have no problem. If you can create a, a million and a half in revenue for me, I'll pay 500,000, no problem. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Find I'm me not, the house. I'm Let's not joking. It. Why are you laughing? I'm totally serious. I'm in. Anybody else in? Drop a comment, please. Um, that's such a cool, cool story. Did you actually talk to, you talked to them yourself? Mm -hmm. And you, you, I mean, were you chuckling a little bit? Like, of course. okay, good. I'm, I'm glad that you had a sense of humor. By about way, it. We, get that, we get the call quite a bit that people are pissed off about their taxes because they're not expecting such a large second check. That, a that's funny, a good problem to have. It's a great so problem to have. as someone that evaluates money and tells you the cost of money, that's a good problem to have. The more <laughs> taxes you pay, the more profit you make. Yep. I love it. That's a cool story. Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Um, are you that involved with the uh, brand and marketing? I know you, you're proud of your 4,000. Uh, how involved are you on the brand and marketing side? Do you guys have a marketing person? We do. We have a marketing director with marketing team. Amazing. So what's, what, what's in this? We're, we're obviously a production studio. What's in the future? Like, where do you see Zoom Casa and brand and marketing strategy over the next like three to five years? So a lot of what we do is help our partners create their own marketing. Okay. So for instance, we have uh, a studio in our office where we allow agents to come in and shoot their own content. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. We have you know, templatized materials that we provide to people. We constantly update them. Uh, other content that we, uh, we help our partners use to market themselves. So, you know, there's a potential down the road that will be more direct in our marketing. But for now, it's mostly B2B to C marketing. Yeah. So it's really... I look at it as we have an internal agency that we subsidize to help our partners market themselves better. Well, I think, I mean, how do you lose? You know, the, the way I look at it is how do you lose by helping people grow their brand and their influence within the communities that they're to serve? They're the ones that are doing it. So I think it's brilliant. Who, did your marketing director come up with that? Like, let, let's create the studio. I'm really looking forward to checking that out. How come you guys decided to start, uh, who came up with the idea to put a studio in? In the space. Uh, it was actually kind of serendipitous. So the space that we leased was formerly occupied by a podcasting company that was purchased by Spotify. So they had these soundproof rooms and they asked us, do you want us to move them or not? And I said, I figured it'd be a good break room or something. We're like, why don't we actually turn it into a podcast room? Well, or video recording room, whatever they want to do. It's okay. Yeah. So we'll get the, all the lingo. I, I, I moved here like five months ago. I live here every day so I can get the lingo down and I can actually talk to these guys. They would talk to me and it would go over my head. I'm like, I don't know what these guys are talking about. Now I love it. That's so, that's such a cool story. So literally it was a podcast studio that you guys converted. Well, no, it was a podcast company that had a couple studios right? and we just left the studios. So smart. I'm yeah. so excited. How long have you been in that space? Four-ish years. Four years? Yeah, we'll be moving in about a month or two. So Oh really? Yeah. But you you how come you're moving? More space. Outgrew it, yeah. You outgrew it. Mm -hmm. Great problem to have. Great problem to have. What what's the year over year growth? You know, how much have you from two thousand uh from twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three, what was the percentage of growth? Top line? Yeah. About double. Really? Yeah. Congrats. Thank that you. that's not a in in our market, you were solving a lot of problems. Yeah. So last year we did our Ford product, we did about a thousand homes. Um, I'm sorry, what? Last year with our Ford product, we did about a thousand yeah. homes. You did a thousand homes? A little bit more than that, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. About 45 states, 46 states. Um, average home value is like 850. So the product's grown really rapidly. And, you know, for us, it's really about once an agent uses this product once or a loan officer uses this product once, it becomes a core part of your toolbox. And what we see is the, what I, the biggest metric I track is repeat usage. So explain that if we do one deal with you as a lender or one deal with you as an, as an agent, we've massively fucked up. So for me, it's critical that our partners understand and use us on a repeat basis. Yeah. If they're not, then we did something wrong. They don't understand. Okay. They either, they don't understand it. We didn't execute. We didn't explain it. Something's wrong. Agents that typically work with us do about five to six transactions per year with us. Oh shit! Mm -hmm. that, I mean that that and that's no joke. I mean even at, at, if they were making two percent, that that's still a significant amount. And you know what I'm excited more about is you're giving them an additional tool that helps the homeowners. Mm -hmm. 
That's what means war to me then. Like, no offense, but I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Yeah, if the, if the agent wins and they get more transaction, great. But I'd much rather them go out of their way to solve more problems. Because I'm so picky. Fred, do you want to know how picky I am now on sure. real estate agents I partner with? If they're not people-centric, relationship-centric, I'm not sending them deals. It's not worth it. Like to me, like in California, especially your, your home isn't a liability anymore. You know, some people just can't maximize, you know, get access to the maximum equity that they have. So that's why I'm so freaking passionate about what you're doing. Cause that's a huge problem. Like, I'm like, why do, why does your average homeowner not to get better, you know, not get to benefit from the sure. for, forced equity that you're getting into these problems. So that's why I'm such a champion of like, that's awesome. Like more homeowners, what do you got to lose by, by looking at your solution versus the traditional solution? And you're not even thinking about probably the investor segment of the market. I mean, how many agents I talk to, yeah, I have investors I work with. Yeah. So what, you're just going to screw your, your homeowner client and rip their face off so you can sell it to your investor? Yeah. I, I would say 90% <laughs> of agents. Yeah. I, and, and I don't, get, look, I'm not a huge, I used to love my industry. I'm not a huge fan of my industry anymore. Mm. Like w with regards to the 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 deliverables that we, uh, the way we take care of people. Like to me, it's about community. It's about taking care of people. You know, I I make I I do well for what I do because I earn it. I work my ass off to make sure that I put all the real estate pressures on myself and not the homeowner. And that's why I'm so I'm so like excited about what you're doing. And you're doing grassroots effort, which is get out there and. Freaking work. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? It's tough, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> what have you ever accomplished that was that was worth it? That was easy? I uh, bought some crypto for a minute there, and I thought I was brilliant, but it didn't last very long. Okay. <laughs> uh, if, the you way. if you kept it, though, it's on the way back. Like, it, it's... <laughs> I don't want to look... I don't want to look at it. So... Um, did you have fun? Today or in general or what? No, I'm, yes, today. Did you have fun? Yeah, I did. You having actually. fun? I am. Awesome. Um, let's jump into who you want to thank. Like who makes who makes your life better every day? Who are the people that you want to thank and give a shout out to? A fantastic executive team. Uh, my COO, Lior Bensby, is brilliant. My CFO, Ted Bernardo, is brilliant. Uh, we have a fantastic sales organization, sales team. Again, I hate the word sales, but they're really in the business of taking care of our partners. Um, you know, and way too many names to, to, to shout now, but it's it's been a journey. And I think is what's nice about the residential real estate space is there's very few industries where you have such a large addressable market. You, know, you take a step back and you're like, in a bad year, 4 million existing homes selling, a good year, 6 million. So, you know, I feel elated that I'm in a place where I can grow this business for the next 50 years. It's not too many business owners that can say that. You okay? So you you have a long game with this. You're not planning on building it up and selling it. Nope. Really? How come? What else am I going to do? Do you ever see yourself retiring and not doing anything? I did that for like three months. Didn't work. What, what did? Okay. What was the hardest part about that? Uh, I suck at golf, so it didn't. You work, suck at golf? Yeah, it didn't work out so well. <laughs> so still working on that, but I enjoy it. Well, uh, you're 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 a new father. I'm a new father. You have a brand new challenge that's gonna. Yep, that's uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting. <laughs> Whole new found appreciation for parents. And Fred, congratulations for that. Thank like you very it much. is. It's uh, if I if I talked to myself, if I had a two month old, she's literally two months. Two months now? Yeah. Okay. Most of the day, uh, it would the be 12th. like twelve. I think it was twelve. It's crazy, man. Like how that. quick. It'll knock your socks off. Like the other day when I got in my car with my oldest and he's driving, that's weird. Just scared the shit out of me. That's just weird. <laughs> really weird. Uh, Fred, I, I have thoroughly, I, I can't thank you enough, man. Like uh, uh, just what you're doing, the impact that you're making, uh, you bringing Dr. Harlan on, me getting a chance. You know, I always look at leaders and it's not about what you say. It's about the culture that you instill. And uh, just his energy, just the people, you know, Joseph, I guess, uh, just that all starts with you. So like way to make a difference for your your people where they're making a difference for other people. 
So we thoroughly enjoyed having you on. And you're going to have to, do you want to come back again? I'd love to. You would? I would love to. All right. Thank you All so right. much. Drop a, drop a comment if you want to see Fred back. <laughs> so Fred doing amazing things. We are out.